Francis Moore Lapé today. Dr. Moore Lapé is a recipient of numerous awards, among which the prestigious Right Livelihood Award, which is the award that many other people who are participating in the teaching today for our campus um, have received. This award was established in 1980 and honors and supports courageous people and organizations offering visionary and exemplary solutions to the root causes of global problems. In 1987, she was the fourth American to receive this award. Frankie has dedicated her life to activism, to writing, and teaching. She is the author of 19 books on world hunger, living democracy, and the environment. Her first book, Diet for a Small Planet, was published in 1971 and was a bestseller. To these days, people talk about it, right? It sold over three million copies. The latest was released in 2017, the so last year, was co-authored with Adam Akin, and it's called Daring Democracy. Her work has been translated in 15 languages. She holds 18 honorary degrees from distinguished institutions, among which uh, Kenyon and Lewis and Clark Colleges, the University of Michigan. She's held many teaching appointments throughout the world. Um, she is the co-founder of the Institute for Food and Development Policy in Oakland, California. With her daughter, Anna, Frankie founded the Small Planet Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is a collaborative network of, for research and popular education to bring democracy to life, something very you know, related to what we were discussing in class. They also co-founded, both of us, the Small Planet Fund, which channels resources to democratic social movements throughout the world. In 1990, she also co-founded, I don't know where you found time to do all this stuff, the Center for Living Democracy to spread the, uh, her ideas on democracy. I could go on and on, of course, but let's have her tell us more about her and her work. Welcome, Frankie, and thanks for being with us today. Uh, shortly, we will be able to show the slides that I think will help you follow this talk that I've prepared for you. And um, so let me just arrange my script here. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And um, I'm going to cover a lot of ground here. And um, I've entitled this talk democracy and the battle for human nature, uh, big claim. Um, so obviously democracy is in crisis, not just here in the United States, but in many, many parts of the world. And in such a moment, it's a perfect time to do some serious digging, serious rethinking about democracy. So I organized my talk in four questions. What is democracy? How essential is it? How realistic is it? And how do we get there? But before I begin in my four questions, there's yet a deeper question that I want to pose to us. And this question, I, you know, I, as many of you know, as I said in the introduction, I began asking why hunger in a world of plenty? But over the decades, that question grew and grew and grew until by the 1990s, there's one question that drives my life. And that is, how do we make sense of the fact that we are together creating a world that not one of us, or virtually none of us, would ever choose? That we actually, we find alien to our basic nature. So how come together we're creating this world that, in many ways, we don't feel at home. In. So to answer that question, um, I've turned to many great thinkers, and um, I've learned that uh, I approached it this way. To understand that, I had to ask, what is unique about our species? And certainly one thing, if not the top thing, is that we are creatures of the mind that we see the world not as it is, but as we are, as Anise Nam said once. And um, 
Albert Einstein said, is this theory which decides what we can observe. In other words, in other words we create a mindset. I think of it as a mental filter that we unconsciously absorb. And literally, we can't typically see outside of that. These core beliefs shape our, our understanding. And so as all of that I'm saying about democracy today really starts with this assumption of the power of ideas to both free us or greatly limit us. And just to, to this believing is seeing notion, uh, not seeing is believing, but that we see what we expect to see. I just want to tell you a very personal story from a couple of years ago. I got up Thanksgiving morning. I was really fired up to cook my favorite, and I think other people's favorite, root vegetable dish. And I run down to the kitchen, I look in all the cupboards, because I know that it's there, this Dutch oven that I make the root vegetables in. And I couldn't find it anywhere. And I got really annoyed. And I went down to the basement, and again, looked at all the shelves. What happened? Why did somebody borrow it and not even tell me? So I started chopping vegetables. And about 20 minutes later, I turned around, and there it was. Only it had a plant in it. Now, I was looking for a kitchen item that you put into an oven, and I usually don't put my plants in the oven. So literally, if we had slides here, I'll, I'll show it to you at some point. It's big, and it's red, and I didn't see it, because I was looking for something to put in the oven, not something to plant. So that's just a really homey, <laughs> To get it, the power of the frame to actually uh, limit what I could see, and so I kind of laughed out loud to my, you know, laughed out loud, thinking that, yeah, there's your proof. <laughs> Believe me, you see. And so I, I start asking then this morning back to the four questions about democracy. What is democracy? And certainly there's the version that you know we think of as the by for and of the Lincoln-esque idea of government is really ours. Certainly we hear that, but mostly, I'm going to tell you, mostly in the United States, we get this very shrunken notion that assuming that human beings are auto autonomous self-seekers, I think the dominant view is that we're selfish little shoppers, uh, then we come up with a very thin, weak duo describing what we think democracy is. It is, I think for a lot of Americans, it means elections, that you can participate in or not, and a lot of us do not, and a market economy. Elections plus market equals democracy. So in that, we have also been told over and over, increasingly so in the last few decades, as I'm going to stress, that it is in the market that our freedom lies, not in democratic government so much, but the market is liberty. So how did we get here? And I want to just share with you uh, just some thoughts that are really present to me right now because of a book that I just discovered that I highly recommend that I was um, called Our Demo uh, excuse me, Our Declaration by a Harvard historian, Danielle Allen. She's African-American parent and a, and a Caucasian parent, and so she brings a perspective that I think is really, really important. It's this book. And so, I'm going to, um, relying on her work and many, many others. Um, okay. Our democracy, the idea that was born, certainly with the, with the, as we scrapped feudalism. And once I was sitting in an audience, as you are, with a very esteemed historian from Harvard, and she said, do you know how feudalism ended? And I grabbed my notebook and I was going to take notes. Yeah. And she paused and said, we stopped believing in it. <laughs> so that was another uh, so, uh, uh, an ally in this idea of uh, the belief that we hold. And certainly the belief, um, our, our framers of our, of our original um, structures, political structures, were part of that scrapping of colonialism and, uh, excuse me, of um, feudalism. And I think they got some things really right and some things dangerously wrong. And I'm just going to quickly mention um, two. Um, Professor Allen writes her whole book on the Declaration of Independence. And it's almost like a meditation on it, where she 
she just looks at every word and phrase and all the deliberations that went on and she has documents where she's marking out. You can see what, you know, how the words were edited. And she concludes that, um, that actually this phrase for which we're familiar, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, she spends uh, almost a whole book just on that. And what she is saying is that really touches me. She notes that we had to make really a strong case for why we were rebelling against the crowd. But we made really no case. We said it is self-evident that all men are created equal. And so she, she says, what does that mean, created equal? It obviously is not equal wealth. It's not equal this and that and the other thing. What is it? And she comes to the conclusion that this core that they got right <laughs> is that what they meant by equality is freedom from domination, and therefore what she calls equality of agency. Now, to me, agency means having a voice, having power over my life, uh, and it's central to my own definition of democracy that I had been working with. And so it also means to me, and she doesn't use this word so much, is I, I love to phrase it this way because it suggests in the possibility of equal dignity, which to me is the very, very core of the confidence in why I'm so such a democracy diehard. <laughs> this equality of dignity. And so um, so from our deeply flawed framers, we received a truly democratic foundational concept if Professor Allen is, is right, and certainly I'm drawn to her, um, to her um, understanding. But what did they get so wrong? Obviously, they <laughs> excluded maybe 60, 70% of population at the time, all women and all slaves. We got that terribly wrong. Um, but the second, I, I feel, is that the failure, the, the, the sort of failure in the very birth of the concept in this country um, was that their premise was equality of agency uh, in political life uh, and failed to recognize um, that, um, that without a broader understanding of equality of agency that equality of agency in political life, in governance, could not hold. Uh, it was always be in danger. And it's interesting, you know, that I'm sure many of you have read Thomas Jefferson worrying about the, what did he call it, the uh, aristocracy of money corporations that are threatening, you know, to overwhelm our government. Certainly, they should have been more aware, to my view, that uh, democracy in this understanding or equality of agency uh, equality of dignity needed to be a broader concept, what I've come to call living democracy as a culture. Now, it's true that over our history, uh, there have been many social movements, especially from the, in the late 1800s and on through to the post-war era, that, that labor movement, social movements began to uh, claim real equality of dignity and agency in arenas beyond simply voting for uh, Government. Um, oh, wonderful! Look at my pictures. You didn't get to see my red pocket. I could show you that later. stay with this for just a, a bit because I really want to dwell on, yes, they got something right, but what did they get wrong? And um, so what happened then with lacking this, this more inclusive understanding of democracy is the multiple dimensions of dignity, including the economic, is that, um, and I'm going to jump to more recent times, <laughs> the last 40, 50 years, um, and what has happened to us. Well, this inherited notion of economic life as, um, you know, this is our dominant area of freedom, we are these autonomous units and we, um, we have freedom of choice in the marketplace, that dominant view. That, um, in, 
Um, let me just take us to about the time Diet First Law Planet was published in 1971. And in writing my most recent book, co-authored with someone, by the way, 49 years my junior, and he and I agreed on every word in the book. He was 23 when we started working together on Daring Democracy. And we then had to come to grips with how did we get so far removed, such, you know, we're now at the lowest level and since polls have been taken in terms of trust in government. Our voter uh, turnout is very poor relative to the rest of the world. How did we get to such a place with such distrust of government and so much uh, feeling of powerlessness? And so, uh, and what struck us was what happened in the 70s and up through today even more so is that uh, those who were the pinnacle, had been the pinnacle of our economic system, literally a few handfuls of or a families of billionaires uh, got very, very worried about what was happening in the 60s, particularly with the environmental movement, the women's movement, the uh, civil rights movement. And so we, uh, this is all now in the public record. It's, it's, it sounds a little bit conspiratorial, but it really has been very well documented by, by a prize-winning journalist, for example, Jane Mayer, the book Dark Money. But I'll just give you the headline version that Adam and I go into in two framing chapters in our book, um, that there was a big alarm going off on the part of the business community. Actually, they felt very, very threatened. And they particularly singled out in one forming document, Ralph Nader, uh, as a, a, as an enemy of, enemy of business. And all he'd done then was to save us from exploding automobiles. But nonetheless, he was particularly singled out. But um, there was the, the Chamber of Commerce in 1971 commissioned uh, a Lewis Powell, who was soon to be appointed a Supreme Court Justice. He was a corporate lawyer. He served on many tobacco company boards. And he created something that is famously known now as the Powell Memo. It's very easy to find online. And many people, including Adam and I, uh, see it as really the, the, um, the playbook, the playbook of what we came to call the anti-democracy movement, that we're still living with the consequences of this very strong movement today. And um, the, the, the laid out in the Powell Memo is that we must reach, well, change people's minds and pe make people understand that the government is uh, the enemy of our freedom and the more we can limit government from interfering in the marketplace, the better. And so we will essentially, uh, let's go from grade school to grad school and in influencing how courses are taught and what, and creating new courses, uh, new programs, in fact, in graduate programs, and use new think tanks, the Heritage Foundation, Cato, etc., to put forth this idea of uh, our freedom in the market and government as a threat to our freedom. And um, part of their strategy, the most dangerous part perhaps, is that they uh, saw that the more government could be dysfunctional and could be nasty and unpleasant, the, the more that Americans would be turned off government as a tool for their own expression of their equality of agency, as Al, uh, um, Daniel Allen puts it. And so uh, we found this speech from Duke Gingrich, who later was in, this, in the 80s, who later was Speaker of the House, who said that this war <laughs> that we're in uh, must be fought with this, this contest to actually destroy the enemy that says uh, that government has a really legitimate role and that, and that we should strengthen you know, our voices through government, to put that aside. Um, he, he wrote that this is a struggle that, that we, must, we must fight with a, um, with a um, duration and a savagery of civil wars. And so it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just, uh, you know, winning an argument with your adversary, it was destroying your enemy, in this case, the Democratic Party, Democratic opponents. So there's a very strong and very successful then uh, work to manipulate our mind against government and pro uh, the quote unquote free market, as well as uh, much. Uh, effort put into actually changing the rules of our democracy, making it harder for people, voter IDs, felon disenfranchisement, those sorts of things, making it harder for people 
to uh, who might be hurt by this understanding of democracy to to push back. And so the consequence then is, as I already mentioned, this great drop in trust in government today. And um, then what emerged and perhaps stated best by Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, many of you have read this when he said, uh, you know, government is not the solution, government is the problem. And he also really, really nailed it for a lot of people when he said he referred to the magic of the marketplace. And so this notion of a free market, which I think we can argue doesn't exist anywhere, there's no such thing as a rules market, certainly, but it had this, he literally used the word magic. And of course, when magic happens, we don't want to go behind the curtain and see what really is going on. Uh, but it's this notion that the market is infallible, it is, you know, it is um, automatic, it works on its own, so we flawed, selfish little shoppers, we, we won't mess it up, you know, because we're outside. And so this, this, this aura of something uh, literally called magic uh, by Reagan has really taken hold. And so with that, we weren't able to see then that uh, in an in a extreme form, our particular, in the United States, our particular market economy is driven by one rule. And that is, do what brings highest return to existing wealth. Sure, that's how it works primarily. And so from that premise then, wealth accrues to wealth accrues to wealth, until we reach the point today, which is almost unfathomable, of, um, yeah, I'm just here. Um, that almost unfathomable that um, three Americans control as much wealth as the bottom half of us. And so, um, and then of course, I think it's understandable that we grasp that that kind of concentrated economic power then infuses and distorts political power away from the very premise of equality of any kind. And so, for example, one half of 1% of Americans contributed two thirds of the funding for the election in 2016. Um, and um, uh, there are now 18 registered, this is just the registered lobbyists, 18 registered lobbyists applying their views to our legislators for every one legislator in Washington that we elected to represent us, 18 to one. Um, so um, this then we did begin to understand why it is that uh, even though the majority of people take something like climate change, right? The majority of Americans, believe it or not, really think that government should be taking action on climate change. What's happened? What's that? Gun control, I could go issue after issue uh, where the majority view is not represented in what our government is doing. And so this lack of a concept of equality of agency and economic life, um, I think plays a very significant role. That without that, uh, then political democracy is always in danger. And we cannot see that it's incompatible, <laughs> incompatible with democracy to have three people controlling half, at some, uh, as much wealth as half of the population of the United States. And I recently I was looking at, have you ever heard of the Electoral Integrity Project based in Harvard and Australian, uh, Sydney, anybody here? It's really worth checking out. Uh, I, I look at it every year and they, look, they looked at uh, 285, I think it is, 200 uh, uh, elections that took place around the world, um, they, the, around the world in um, uh, over five years, 285 elections over five years from 2012 to 2017. And the U.S. 2016 election, in terms of our integrity, and they have 11 measures, they have 3,000 observers around the world, we ranked 130th next to Colombia. And on gerrymandering in the United States, we were ranked at the bottom three. I think only Malaysia was worse than we are. Malaysia has a very big problem with gerrymandering. So it's not like, oh, we're just not quite as good as those social democracies in Europe. No, 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 no. We are way down the list. And similarly, with inequality in our country is so extreme. Uh, compared, we don't even, not even in the same category as Western Europe. So, back to the question, what is democracy? And 
um, I have, this is one of my favorite things to quote. Can you see it? Ever. This is William Hastie, who was the first African-American appellate judge in the United States. And he says, democracy is not being, it is becoming. It is never finally won, but its essence is eternal struggle. And believe it or not, I used to drop off that last line to an audience because I was afraid the struggle would put them off. But I think today we now know it is the good struggle. It is the essential struggle. And um, so he nailed it for me, that democracy is not a destination, it is a journey. And what, is, what guides that journey? Um, it is a journey that um, I believe um, really um, um, I think of it this way, uh, and love to have the time for discussion with you, but that it is a journey toward the realization of three conditions. Wide, inclusive distribution of power, transparency in public affairs, and what I call mutual accountability instead of the blame game we have today. That is a cultural condition. The others are both cultural and structural. So this is what, I'm going to come back to this in a moment, but this is really what I mean when I, that democracy lives or dies, I claim, to the degree to which we are moving, not that, we haven't hit there yet, but we are moving toward greater fulfillment of those three social conditions. So um, it is this commitment then, and now I want to ask the second question. Um, is democracy essential? Um, so, this is um, the second um, question. Um, is it essential? So, I'm suggesting that we have enough social history behind us that we can say that these three conditions that I've put forth are, in fact, essential. Now, what I'm really um, suggesting here is that I'm saying that these three conditions are, have, have proven over our social history to bring forth the best in our species and to keep the worst in check. And here's what I mean. Distributed inclusive power. I think we can see from whether we're talking about bullies on the playground, whether we're talking about genocide, whether we're talking about lab experiments such as the, have you ever heard of the Stanford prison experiment? Um, that concentrated power often enables most of us, not just a few of us, to do some pretty horrific things. And secondly, transparency. Um, during the wind-up to the great crash here, the great recession during the wind-up, I understand that some of the people who were slicing and dicing those risky derivatives, their slogan was IBG, YBG, I'll be gone, you'll be gone, meaning that they're going to get out of there before this all hits the fan. And guess what? They were right. They none of them went to jail. But the point is, they knew they were operating in secrecy. I have another little amusing example of that. There, there's a study done on UK professors who had an honor system coffee station. And the, the professors weren't paying for their coffee. And so some clever psychologist put a photo of human eyes above the coffee station, and the professors started paying for their coffee. Just a suggestion that somebody was looking at them. So. We do a lot better when things are transparent. Um, and then the third condition is that I've been calling mutual accountability instead of the blame game. In other words, um, if we all understand that we are all connected, uh, then 
we're all implicated. And we can't just blame those <laughs> Wall Street guys because where were we as citizens when we allowed Wall Street to become so deregulated? So we've got to step up as well. Um, and so this, um, this third condition of, of uh, why democracy is essential, that's the point I'm making right now, is why those three elements that I identify as the essence of a democratic culture, why they're essential. And on this, there's really bad news about our, I'm going to get to some really good news about our character, but science, uh, the experimenters at Yale in particular and other places have found that even infants, even infants show signs of othering, so signs of blaming, that even infants will prefer a puppet who has the same taste in snacks that they do, and they'll want to punish the puppet who has different taste in snacks. I mean, that's the scariest study I have ever seen. But the point is, we, growing up as a species for me, capable of democracy, we have to accept that about ourselves. That is our Achilles heel of our social nature, that we, that we are very vulnerable to othering. But we can work with that, and that's a, a longer speech than this I can give today, but the point is that, um, that we, these three qualities of a living democracy, I believe, in a strong case, that they are essential. Um, so um, here's, the, here's the next step in my thinking then, and, and it's a much more positive note, because uh, I think that one could argue also that um, democracy and these three elements is essential for yet another reason that only with a democratic culture defined as I am is it possible for human beings to meet the three deep, deep needs beyond the physical. Certainly the physical. Food, water, yes. Only with a genuine, uh, accountable, mutually accountable democracy when you have those physical needs met, which we're not achieving now. But our psychological needs, our spiritual needs for agency, that is power, meaning, a sense of purpose in our lives beyond our own survival, in connection with, our, with others and the earth, that those needs, I argue today, can only mean that in a democratic culture. So the third question is, the third question is, okay, is democracy possible? Are human beings even capable of democracy? That's a really important question. And I think I can make a very convincing case that indeed we evolved with, set aside the othering for a moment, we evolved with deeply, deeply pro-social needs and capacities. Uh, first, um, um, fairness. Even Adam Smith, you know, the supposed godfather of greed, he said, humans are in some peculiar manner tied, bound, and obliged to the observation of fairness. And I don't know if you've seen these studies, but even in other primates, capuchin monkeys are known to throw back a ration that they've gotten from their caretaker if their buddy in the next cage got something a little tastier. That, no, it's not fair. So fairness runs deep, and not just in our species. Um, and uh, there's also this sense of uh, empathy toward others. Brilliant anthropologist Sarah Blacker Hurdy uh, argues that we evolved this deep empathy uh, and capacity for cooperation because we are the only species that trusts others, of uh, the only primates that trust others to care for our offspring. And that led to this deep uh, mirror neurons. We have to be able to read each other very carefully. Are you trustworthy or I can't leave you my baby with you? And so we have clearly deep capacities for empathy. And finally, cooperation. Um, my favorite experiment here is they looked at our brains when we were competing and cooperating, and they found that when humans can cooperate, that parts of our brains are stimulated similar to eating chocolate, that we evolved with such pleasure in cooperation. And uh, uh, Thomas uh, Thomasello, Professor Thomasello in Leipzig, uh, takes it a bit further, and he said, what is unique about our, our uh, our, uh, of Homo sapiens is not just cooperation, but what he calls shared intentionality. That we had the capacity to develop plans together and carry them out, obviously essential 
to a democratic culture. So there it is. Um, um, so we do have those. Now, um, um, the next question. Um, are, you know, is this are we capable question. Um, I want to, um, sorry, let me just check in here. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons that uh, anthropology, <laughs> if I can blame you all, uh, has kind of dimmed our view of capacity for democracy is that the dominant frame, and I don't know if, you know, you'll tell me if you've absorbed that, but I'm not really a student of anthropology, but I have absorbed this idea that, yes, back in our hunter-gathering days, we were egalitarian and in many ways. We learned how to keep bullies in check and to keep keep uh, the tribes together because we so depended on each other so directly. But then agriculture happened, right? And I absorbed being a student in, in that world so uh, that with agriculture, then we could develop surplus and that meant we could lord it over others and we could deprive and we could get power over others and that's when the hierarchies began. Well I I, I just read the most um, uh, revisionist version or uh, challenge to that by two uh, anthropologists, uh, one David Graeber, one David Wingrow in London School of Economics and Your Students College London. And they said, no, it's really not true. When you look at the new findings in archaeological sites, I'll just quote them. They said, agriculture did not mark an irreversible threshold in social evolution. The first cities were often robustly egalitarian. And later they write about cases in the Middle East. Neolithic societies look strikingly egalitarian when compared to their hunter-gatherer neighbors. So that kind of shakes up this whole idea that we had this, this uh, sort of this dreamland of egalitarian hunter-gatherism, but then it all the fall came with agriculture. Uh, so it's something to look into, but my point really is uh, that uh, we come very soft-wired with these, uh, these capacities that I mentioned. So now then, the final, the fourth question of my four is, how do we get there? How do we get there? Um, how do we get to moving in the direction if you buy any of what I've said, moving in the direction of actually bringing these three um, dispersion and inclusion in power, transparency in public affairs, and a um, culture of mutual accountability, how do we start moving in that direction? And so you know that I believe so much in the power of ideas, so <laughs> clearly uh, part of what I'm suggesting is that we um, begin to work on telling ourselves the truer story about who humans are, that we truly are not these autonomous, just self-seeking individuals, that we are uh, relational, we are social beings with these very deep needs for power, meaning, and connection in our lives. Um, and, and to really encourage ourselves to think uh, of this uh, as a moment in which, yes, democratic culture has been sinking, and sometimes it feels like we just went into a sinkhole in the last year, um, but nonetheless, um, that it could serve as this incredible awakening to a complacent uh, populace. And so um, I think this reclaiming belief in the possibility of democracy is absolutely essential for all of us. Uh, and to understand, and I like to put it, that to save the democracy we thought we had, we must take democracy to where it's never been. And so um, in that, I want to encourage us this thought, um, um, that I personally, I'll, I'll just speak personally, and I hope it relates to you, that I really find it comforting and empowering to realize that it is not the magnitude of a challenge that crushes the human spirit. It is not the magnitude. It is um, feeling futile, feeling useless that does people in. And I think that's certainly true for me and everyone I know, and um, it's, it's, that's what just killed us. And so my argument for the rest of the final part of my talk is simply that um, if human beings know that something is essential, I'm trying to make that case today, that it is at least possible, we don't even have to believe it's probable, but just possible, and we can see a place for ourselves in making even a small difference 
that we often will take huge risks, jump in, and go for it. And so I just want to underscore that, that yes, I admit, the challenge is huge. But I think all three of those ingredients are there. That we can just see that it, democracy is essential. I'm making that case today. We can see that, um, that it's at least possible. And I'm going to make that case stronger. And finally, that there is a place for us. So what is that place for us? OK, here's the happiest day of my public life. Don't I look happy? Okay, this is when my life changed. This was April 2016. I had just marched from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. after thinking I couldn't walk 10 miles. I made it, and this was the, one of the largest civil disobedience on the Capitol steps uh, for democracy. And the reason it was a life-changing moment for me is that for the first time in my life ever, I know I knew in that moment, and that's why I look so happy, that I am part of something that is the democracy movement, capital D, capital M. Because what happened is that well over maybe 150 organizations, from labor to uh, Black Lives Matter to NAACP to, um, to Sierra Club to Greenpeace, all came together to march for democracy reforms, money out of politics, protecting and extending the right to vote. And um, so that was the pivotal moment, and that is the most exciting thing going on in America today for, for, for me, certainly. And so the, the huge thing, I, I don't know if you can read that text in this light, but it says it is a movement of movements. And yes, I was part of that war on poverty, that movement, and I've been other part, but I've never seen before a movement of movements for democracy. So all these groups that I just mentioned, like Greenpeace and Sierra Club, and they all came together in 2013, and they created the Democracy Initiative, an umbrella organization that's, that, yes, we're all keeping our separate agendas, but we're all coming together around democracy. Now, 63 organizations representing 40 million Americans have identified, yes, if I'm going to work against climate change, I also have to be working for democracy. And so that, um, that um, is um, really the, 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 um, the possibility that I see today. And the reason that it gives me such sense of possibility is that it, it, it enables people it enables people to discover what Adam and I came to call the thrill of democracy. That we think of democracy as a dull duty or an obligation or just you know something we gotta have, but you know I'd rather do something else. To what we came to call the thrill of democracy, because Adam and I talked and talked and talked during the walk and after the walk. What happened to us? Why was there such an internal shift in terms of our confidence and commitment and vision? And it was for these three reasons that um, we could see that um, by bonding with strangers, I mean, I met Iraq vets and ex-bankers and all sorts of people as we slept on church floors along the way, I would never have met otherwise. And it, it changed me inside. I thought, oh, wow, if these people, so different from me, if they understand democracy, is required for all of us, then maybe maybe I'm not such a kook, you know, maybe I'm not such an outsider. And so that sense really, really was a strong part of it. Um, another thing that happened to us, we realized, and there was a moment when we felt it, we were marching in the last hour through the streets of DC toward the Capitol steps where we had this huge sit-in. And we were chanting, Whose democracy? Our democracy. Whose democracy? Our democracy. That was my favorite chant. And the Capitol Dome came into focus. And Adam and I both started bawling. And we said, what? what's going on? And honestly, I could feel like the synapses in my brain were like reconfiguring. And I realized what happened in that moment. I said, oh, those guys in there, well, those people in there, they work for me. <laughs> I'm the owner of this democracy. And I know it sounds a little corny, a little cheesy, my daughter would say, but um, 
it was real. It was that sense, oh, it's in our responsibilities that our power lies, and I'm responsible. They work for me, and I've got to take charge as the owner of our democracy. And the third element was this notion of civil courage, and I'm going to end there, end in a moment on that note, is um, that doing what you thought you could not do, I'm sure you've all experienced that, how then that gives you the sense, oh, what else can I do that I didn't think I could do? So um, in this, in this movement of movements, expressing the thrill of democracy, our office had this idea if there was just one hub, one place people could come to learn about the democracy movement, figure out how to plug in. And so we created something online. It's still very far from this vision, but we're going to get there. It's um, fieldguidetodemocracy.org. And you can see all the different organizations lining up. And eventually, we're going to have this mix and match so you could put in your zip code and make it really, really interactive to what's happening right here and who, how to find a mentor, how to find a buddy, and how to register your brave actions. All of that is going to come to, the, to this site, but we, at least we've got a beta up. And um, the other piece of this is that on this site, this is just a hint of it, uh, but on this site, you'll be able to see the kinds of changes that are underway that across all dimensions of the democracy deficit addressing them. For example, you can read about something called democracy vouchers in Seattle, where every citizen gets four uh, uh, vouchers, of four each worth $25, that they then, at last uh, uh, city elections, they could, could assign to the candidate of their choice, called democracy vouchers. And it brought so many people into the process, including many more young people, many more people of color, and the people who who received them were the winners, not the people who took private money, but the people who took the, the citizens' money. The democracy vouchers won the races. And now this approaches a bill in Congress to introduce this at some point soon. Uh, and uh, I want to shout out here also to California, because one of the things we learned about California is you have one of the most interesting and exemplary uh, new um, commission for redistricting to avoid partisan districting. And I got to see a presentation by uh, the folks who are members of it, and they said that to, to create this, this really uh, impartial districting commission so that you don't have gerrymandering in California, that's the goal, that the last stage they actually had one of those tumblers that you see in a bing, um, in bingo game where you just <laughs> a random number gets pulled out. So they went through. It's a whole list of really interesting things they went through to keep it fair and to make it real and all of that. So that was, um, I just wanted to to uh, introduce you to that. And then as I begin to wrap up, uh, I want to speak more personally for a moment of what is required, what is called for in this moment, and really emphasize that um, today, um, in such a time that we're alive, that goodness may no longer be the opposite of evil, that courage is the opposite of evil, because we cannot uh, just, goodness without courageous action, I believe, is not good enough right now. And fortunately, there's so many powerful steps that we can take. And so we really need to rethink um, uh, uh, the whole idea of courage and to recognize that um, what we thought of as fear stopping us and here's my little cheesy contribution on that score. I, uh, when I got really nervous a few years ago when I was going to stand up and say something I knew was super controversial, and my heart was going boom, 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 boom. I said, oh, Frankie, you are the reframer. Just reframe it. That's your inner applause going off, cheering you on. And so to, to recognize that to do what's called for today, we do have to do that rethinking of fear as a source of energy, not as a stop sign telling us to stop. And we need to realize that courage is contagious. And no matter what you're doing that is stepping out, taking a risk, that doing something that you thought you could not do, somebody is watching. And in this case, uh, this is a young rabbi there in the, in the, um, in the neon jacket. And he, uh, he just got he just became a rabbi and decided that the most important thing he can do right now is to carry on in Pennsylvania 
uh, the same kind of thing we did in Democracy Spring, and did a beautiful, beautiful action in uh, the state capitol against, uh, oh, for um, a ban on gifts to legislatures. In, 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 in Pennsylvania, there are no gift bans for legislatures. So this is an example of courage is contagious. And my final thought is simply this, and that uh, I find this incredibly freeing, that um, I think we all in this kind of audience would share uh, a relational worldview, an ecological worldview, that we're all connected, change is the only thing that is constant, and therefore that we're all co-creators of the future. And so in that world, in that world, it is simply impossible to know what's possible. So I'm not an optimist, I'm not a pessimist, I am a possibilist. And if it's not possible to know what's possible, we are free. We are totally free to go for the world we want. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can tell I really uh, love talking to you. <laughs> Please. I'll repeat the question, too. Yeah. Yes. Atheist? <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Can you all hear? The voting, you voted, you know, changing things and making it illegal. How, like, I guess my question is, what should change first? Like, what should change first? Like, our vote? Correct. Or their yeah. Great. Actually, I saw a bumper sticker once in Marin County that said, if God had meant us to vote, he would have given us candidates. <laughs> Whoa, yeah. The same idea. That, um, so, um, voting, um, well, I strongly believe that uh, voting is a, a responsibility, a duty even, um, and that um, even if we, uh, you know, there's some places in, in the world that you, 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 you're required to show up, which you can mark on the ballot, none of the above, and of course we don't have that yet, but I do think that absolutely that even um, in our very flawed party system, with neither party standing up for what I'm talking about here, that there still is a difference among candidates. But I think it's really the most exciting thing, and I'm sure many of you are following this with me, of how many people who've never run for office are now running, especially females running for office. And, and so there are going to be many more candidates that really warrant our, our, uh, you know, our, our vote. And that there's so many, like in, I was just looking at, uh, on our website, the Field Guide for Democracy, we have a, um, a map of the United States where you can click on your state. And I just looked at California, and one of the really critical things that's going to be up for, you know, that you can weigh in with your legislators on is a disclosure uh, a bill that would require anybody gathering signatures for an initiative to disclose the top three donors behind it. And I'm sure many of you who've been through elections here or been through initiative campaigns here know how much corporate power has come, in, has come in to try to distort the messages. And so I think that those kinds of things, too, is not just voting in, uh, for president, but really weighing in on something like that as well um, and, and contacting your legislators about bills like that that move democracy along. And showing up, for example, in your, you have the very, as far as I know, the very best uh, organized redistricting commission, the most diverse, representative geographic, representing the population, and um, they held hearings um, on their process. And that's an incredible opportunity as if you have citizens to participate and to have your voices heard. So when opportunities like that arise as well. So in my, I'm not sure I totally answered your question, but, um, and just remember that you are all influencers, and you, 
you know, for your friends who are despairing or your friends who are just pulling away from any engagement, I hope that, that there's some messages here and our book, Daring Democracy, would give you some, um, you know, some, some ways to, to make clear, you know, what, what voice, what power we do have and uh, this theme of it's not possible to know it's possible. Because really, we, you know, it, I, it, I'm 74 and, and I love being old because now when I say, oh, in my lifetime, I've never seen anything like this, you know, it really has weight. And so I feel like in my lifetime, this is an extraordinary opportunity because people are so disaffected and so eager for something that seems real and there's a place for them and it's essential to do. But please, um, more questions? Yes, please. I'm sorry, I can't hear. That, that that when it dawned on me, wait, you know, they work for me. I'm the owner of this democracy. Well, who are the owners? Is it just people who can vote as citizens? And I think that, you know, I hope I make clear that I see democracy as not simply a structure of government that we vote for. It is a culture. It is a culture, and everybody shapes that culture by how we raise our children, what we expect of them, how we work, uh, deal with others in the workplace how we take responsibility for our own actions, all of that is shaping a democratic culture or a culture of fear, you know? And I think whether or not one can literally vote, one can uh, be engaged and have influence. And um, so I, I think um, in that sense, we are all owners of this culture, we, even if we can't literally uh, help choose who is elected to office. And since I'm arguing that Democracy is a much broader uh, concept and essential need than simply the political. It also has to do with economic life. I just point to Jackson, Mississippi now, which has leadership in, in making progress um, uh, across the board through worker ownership, through co-ops, through uh, land trust in a number of ways. And we can all participate in those things. One needn't be a voter to do that. So thank you for that great question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That's another really tough and really great question. Uh, you know, people are so disaffected now, and uh, politics has been made so nasty that a lot of people, I'm just kind of said, for those who didn't hear, you know, just what, do we, how do we engage with them? And I think that um, the more that we can create opportunities for social encounters, that the more that we can invite people to things that, you know, share, sharing food together, sharing, uh, any kind of interest that we can bring uh, and then um, in that context where people feel safer and, and can recognize that we're just people like they are, you know, to bring up uh, this alternative way of thinking about it and whether we disagree or agree that the value of um, our voices making that clear that not just that checking out is checking just, I always say, the only choice we don't have is whether to change the world. Because our inaction, just as much as our action, in some ways, is also shaping the world around us. So to really help people understand that, yes, we agree things are really nasty, and we can, we can still have a voice. And, um, and showing that the dignity has become my key concept now in my life. Is, what is it that allow, allows people to move from feeling humiliated and left out, which I think is so much of what happened in the Trump election, to feeling that they are respected as people 
worthy and and uh, having dignity. So that's not really a very uh, in, um, specific answer to your question, but um, I think uh, that uh, that the spirit of it, and and of course the more you know, I, I'm I'm thinking the more that we exude enthusiasm, and I, I just look at you, I think you would naturally do that. You know enthusiasm and a positive spirit about it, the more people who are disaffected to say, oh, she's not angry, she's excited about this. You know, she's not out to prove me wrong, she's she's just really excited about being and having a voice. And I think suddenly, even if it's unconscious in some way, that people say, yeah, well, I kind of like to be more like that myself, because we are social mimics. And so the more that we can be that way, <laughs> the more I think People will want that, you know. They'll want to be in that energy, and uh, and I would say also on this theme of courage is contagious, and it's a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's related. You know, how do we gain more courage to to go ahead and put ourselves in that awkward situation? It's I, since we're social mimics. I, I often say to myself, I just need one person more courageous than I, and then I'll become more courageous by hanging out with them. And then sometimes I say, marry them if you can. You know, get that courage really close in. So, um, you know that that you can model that, but you can also look for those who, you know, you're you're who are a little more risk taking in this way or, than you, and, and hang out with them and grow that grow that sense. Yes, please. Wonderful, great, great example. Um, this is how the power of community. And uh, thank you, Alice. It's great to know about. And we'll add that to our Field Guide to Democracy website. So, uh, yes, please. There's also another movement within the movements, and uh, it started out with a group called Living Room Conversations. Living Room Conversations, uh huh. And now I think there's several others. And what they do is bring people together who have different views. Uh -huh. and you can hear the different views of other people, and eventually you can begin to understand each other's views, at least, and 
maybe even convince you know the other person of yours, but doing it in a situation where you are you know reasonable and not yelling at each other and not uh -huh. being angry, so that we can start communicating. Fabulous, fabulous. I want to point out that on that march, the Democracy Green March, there were people from the Tea Party, actually. There was a, one of the founders. And it, it, we, in all that we're doing, we're trying to uh, have that exactly what you're describing, that spirit. Yes, please. Um, what, what you're talking about, cultural democracy, um, like when I've done a lot of canvassing, What's great is that when I've been canvassing, it's like I have a thing that I'm about. And then the first thing they do, they go, well, I don't care about that. And I go, okay, well, what do you care about? Uh-huh, good. So, like you were saying, when you get energy, when you're positive and you're actually open enough to listen, I think most people don't ever feel listened to. Exactly. And I think, like I was in a political group doing anti-fracking work, and a lot of people wanted to take it over. They said, we need leadership, we need an executive committee, we need people who are going to make decisions. And they were like, wait a minute, is this a democratic group? Or is this corporate, you're recreating your corporate structure? That created a discussion. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It fractured the group. A lot of feelings were hurt. But ultimately, the thing is, having, being for something, like um, there was just a strike here on campus, a lot of people were striking because there's a lot of people who work here who barely make enough to live in the county. Actually, they don't make enough to live in the county. But there was a lot of student support for it. Mm -hmm. And so the beauty of it was there's a conversation right there. Mm -hmm. And and it's great, like you said, when you go and listen, it's like, well, okay, why are you striking? So it's great when people are for something. And I think that conversation thing sounded really cool. Yeah, absolutely. It, because sometimes it's hard to be in a situation because everyone's really defensive mm -hmm. around the stuff that they think they really believe in mm -hmm. and that they think you're against it. And, you know, you're in Santa Cruz and I said, dude, I didn't live here my whole life. You know, I lived in the Midwest. You know, I'm running around hunting and guns and four-wheelers and beer and people who don't give a shit because they think the government doesn't care. And I'm like, well, I mean, we're the government and I care about you, so mm -hmm, tell me mm -hmm. what's the deal. And to me, that's the culture of yes, democracy. Yes, 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 yes. I, I love, I love your, all of your contributing, and it brings to mind another thing that we could, being here in California, uh, there's a particular example that I find so inspiring now. I'm reading a book called Refinery Town about Richmond, California. Are you all aware of the uh, about 20 year effort there to create the Citizens Alliance that is bringing together uh, union people, uh, environmental justice people, immigrant rights people, and uh, have been able to get elected to the majority of the city council despite multi-million dollar campaign backed by Shell Oil. So, um, you know, this is, we need these examples to encourage us to see possibility of people listening from very different backgrounds and while they have been, they've got together and, and, and had a majority on the city council, they did both pieces, all number of pieces of democracy together. They passed public financing for their elections of their city council. They uh, set the minimum wage at one of the highest in the country. They kept a lim limit on uh, how much you could increase rent on 10,000 units and um, have a police review board that is really helping to deal with uh, our uh, unjust <laughs> justice system. So. You know, I think the more that we can hear these examples of people successfully talking to one another and then uh, have examples of people coming together across uh, class, race, you know, any line to, to make simultaneously make it democracy advances and economic advances and social advances, I think that is so encouraging to me that, it, it, that it's possible. Yes, please. Um, Last question. Um, so I know you're mentioning how it seems like a need to use the case for us in the government. I know that's not always the case. Do you think that in order to get back to what the populace that trusts the government, there will be a moment of crisis in order for them to think that we need to come in like other economic environment? Or do you think it's possible through like, the different steps that 
Well, I think that, that it is possible that this moment of crisis can, uh, that we are then motivated to uh, change the rules of our political democracy so that we can have trust in it. Um, that is foundational, and so in our, uh, I, um, I don't want to push my own book too much, but I will say in Daring Democracy, we, a real short book, really pointed, uh, we, we, we uh, tell the stories of the successful reforms and getting money out of politics at the state level, a city level, uh, protecting voting rights. There's now, because Oregon took the lead, automatic voter registration uh, is now in 10 states plus D.C., and that happened with just in, and we know that with automated, actually the term is changing now to automated voter registration, that more people get registered and more people vote, and, and often people uh, uh, who wouldn't have voted, you know, who would be blocked by the anti-democracy movement. Things like uh, felon reenfranchisement now has 71%, uh, is polling at 71% in Florida to reenfranchise 1.6 million people in Florida. That is a game changer. Most of them African American would be reenfranchised at they paid their dues to society uh, and and they were still denied the right to vote and that could change that. So uh, I'm kind of going off here on your your comment, but um, you know I do think that um, that um, sorry I lost my train. Remind me what you said. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what. Yes. I think we recognize we're in crisis, but what we don't see, and what I'm so passionate about, is that that uh, we don't see this rising democracy movement in all these different kinds of examples around the country. Um, and so I think all of these, whether it's felon reenfranchisement, uh, uh, automated voter registration, so that you know people aren't being shut out just because they're poor people of color, but that restores, this is my link I was trying to get to, res begins to restore trust in government and gradually we can begin to build. I know there's a movement in the country, I just went to a conference at Harvard, they're uh, part of it, it's, um, it's, a move, it's a contest among colleges to try to get, I believe, 80% of the students, some, some large percent to vote, and uh, the, the all-out campaign on the campuses. Um, Tufts in, in, in my area in Boston is another one that's part of this. So that's something else to look into uh, and, and open the conversation with students about why voting is important if they, especially those that have become so disaffected and so discouraged now under this administration. So I, I think that this act that virtually nothing can happen in a society where nobody trusts. So I mean, trust is the basis of everything. But it's got to be based on something real, and I, that's why we hope our field guide to democracy can, can go see that movement and find a place for them in it. And all the examples that were brought up, the living room discussion, the uh, resist, what, is, what was it called? Resist, replace. resist and replace, resist and replace. Um, all of these are part of that rebuilding trust because people see that they do have a voice and can have a voice together in community. So thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. I so love to talk to young people. Now that I, I have a co-author uh, relationship too. I just want to say on that that I think another thing that's really special is the intergenerational aspect of the democracy movement. Uh, that I think my experience is not unique and 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 uh, we had kind of had a snotty attitude, you know, in the 60s, right? Anybody over 30, we couldn't trust. And I don't feel that with uh, younger people today. And I think get, get gives us a lot of power. So thank you.